You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. It's Monday again, folks, and we're back with another smashing rarity. This time, it's The Thing from the Barrens, by the American author Jim Kelgard. The Arctic Yarn debuted in Weird Tales back in September 1945. We hope you enjoyed, folks. The Thing from the Barrens by Jim Kelgard I, George Mallory, graduate geologist, could only guess about the thing that came from the Barrens. I saw the horrible outrages it committed, but never the thing itself. Pug Davenport saw it. Now, his head literally torn from his body, Pug lies in the cemetery at North City. His should be a world-honoured grave. Pug might have saved all humanity, and certainly saved the five hundred people who made their homes in North City. He— But hear the story. I told myself that I did not know why I was staying in North City. Farthest North Metropolis, we called ourselves, after the Blanding Corporation built our city, peopled it, and then abandoned everything when the radium ore petered out. I could have gone when Blanding quit, collected my salary, and taken a job in Russia. But I didn't go, and our so-called metropolis of five hundred people did not fold either. Some left, but others drifted in to take their places, and the population remained static. I lived because I had an independent income. Others did whatever there was to do. Pete Gallagher set up his store. Joe Urschel came along with his saloon. A few men did odd jobs, and most of the remaining three hundred adult males went into the barrens to trap. That was a hard life. The trappers would be gone for weeks, and sometimes months, with no intercourse whatever with other human beings. But they brought in plenty of white foxes, ermine, caribou hides, wolf pelts, fisher, and wolverines. Though I often went into the barrens to hunt caribou and wolves, I did no trapping. Frankly, I lacked the hardihood to start out with a few dogs and a three-month supply of grub to spend a three-month-long night facing the lashing gales and everything else that could roar across the winter-bound Arctic. Then I did not need the money. It was a dull life, but I had never intended to make it a permanent one. I read my books and imported new ones to keep abreast of developments in my own field. But when I told myself that I did not know why I was staying in North City, it was a lie. Because I did know. I stayed because of Marsha Davenport. <laughs> That's right, a girl. Ask me why, and I cannot answer you. I had dined and danced with what supposedly are the most beautiful and charming women in the world. Those found in the salons of New York, Paris, Santiago, Moscow. And I was madly in love with the little daughter of a fox-trapper a girl so devoted to her drunken and worthless father, that the most she had ever given me was a friendly smile and a kind word. But I could neither help myself nor leave North City without her, and if Pug Davenport had taken his daughter and gone to the North Pole, I would have followed and built my igloo as close to theirs as possible. It was that way. Marsha and Pug had blown into North City with the first settlers Blanding had sent in, Pug was a wizened little man with a crosshatch of red veins hopelessly netting his features. He was supposed to be an explosives expert, but I suspect that, back in what must have been a very checkered career, he had been an expert on anything he'd want to name, including safe-blowing and larceny. When Blanding pulled out, Pug stayed in the house they gave him and went in for fox-trapping. Marsha? How can I tell you about her? Does it mean anything to say that she was a girl, almost twenty years old, beautiful, tall and lithe, with raven hair through which shone coppery overtones? <laughs> that doesn't express it. All I can say is that what happens to maybe one man in a million had happened to me. I knew that I could never go anywhere unless she went with me. To have her as my wife would be the consummation of everything. 
If I could not have her, to be near her was second choice. But all during the twenty months since they had come to North City, Marsha's time had been given to Pug. She took him home when he was drunk, which was whenever he had any money. She nursed him through his hangovers, and when he was home spent all her time making for him the things he liked. When he was out on the barrens, she worried about him. That little, drunken, worthless father of hers had woven such a spell about her that she seemed unable to think of another man. But yet she must think of other men. She was young, alive, human. Some day, I hoped, she would break this shell she had built around herself and let me in. That was the day I lived for. Meanwhile, I had danced with her a few times, and when Pug was out on the barrens, I could go see her once in a while. That was what kept me hoping. The fox trappers had been out on their lines for six weeks now, and the half-light of winter had blanketed North City for two, when I stepped out of my house into the street. There was not much snow. Farther south, they get more of that than we do, and most of what falls here is blown away by the wind. That had been from the east for the past twenty days, and there were deep drifts along the eastern walls of all the houses. I had intended to go down and see Marsha, when I dimly made out a dog team lying in front of Joe Urschel's saloon. As soon as I was close enough, I saw that it was Pug Davenport's team. That was a surprise. In spite of his habits, Pug is tough and hard, and usually stays out on the barrens as long as anybody. This time, I figured, his thirst must have become unbearable. Evidently, he had just blown in, and Marsha didn't know he was here. But she would appreciate somebody's giving him a hand, and I went into Urschel's. Urschel had his own power plant. Every spring, the Nanook, North City supply ship, brought him twenty fifty-gallon drums of gasoline to run it. I blinked in the unaccustomed glare of electric lights and looked at the bar. Two of North City's winter residents, Moosehide Allen and Al Pettigrew, were hanging over it. Urschel would have starved if he depended on winter trade. His big killing was made when the fox trappers came back. Furs were currency, and he was getting rich. Now there was a great pile of white fox furs, bigger and silkier than I had ever seen before, on one end of the bar. I stepped up. "'What'll you have, George?' Urschel asked. "'Make it scotch.' I fingered the drink he poured, and looked at the pile of foxes. A white fox is a little thing. Some of them aren't much bigger than cats. But those pelts were nearly wolf size, and yet definitely they were foxes. Pug Davenport, somewhere out on those lonely barrens, had found a breed of foxes the like of which man had never seen before. Don't smile at that. Spread a map of the North American continent before you. From Key West, Florida, to Point Barrow, Alaska, you cannot find an unnamed place. You can then understand why cartographers, and even some explorers, have declared the world an open book with no new frontiers. Actually, nothing could be farther from the truth. Even though it takes you only a tenth of a second to move your pointing finger from one named place to the other, it might take you one hundred days to walk between those same places. That's what we had around North City. Men had gone into the barrens, but not into all of them. Even in thickly populated states, there are still places where no man has set foot. A lot of things that we never dreamed existed are yet going to be found right in our own backyards. I looked at the pelts again, noted their size and texture. Ordinarily, it pays to give strict attention to your own business in North City, but I asked Urschel, Where'd you get them? Pug Davenport brought them in. Said I should send half the money from down to Marsha, and he'd drink up the rest. Wow, you should be able to drink until July. Urschel looked at me, his eyes hard. He will be. No offense meant, I told him. Give me another drink. I took the drink he poured and backed against the bar to look around the unlighted back end of the room. Pug Davenport sat at a corner table, the darkest and most inaccessible one he could find, with a bottle of whiskey before him. As I looked, he tilted the bottle to his mouth and drained out a teacup full. I waited a minute. Pug can be ugly when he's drunk. Then took my drink and walked over to him. Hello, Pug, I said. 
He looked at me and shrank as far as he could down into his chair, his trembling hand straight out to grasp my sleeve. George, he said unsteadily, sit close to me, George. He pulled a chair around and me down on it. Again he raised the bottle, took a drink that would have floored an ordinary man, and his right hand took a firm grip on my left arm. I frowned. There was something here that should not be. I had known Pug Davenport to be almost anything except afraid. He went farther out on the barrens than anyone else, and laughed at those who dared not go with him. Always he had been ready to face anything. But now, both from the way he gripped my arm, and in the way his eyes met mine, I knew that he was terrified. I told myself that he was probably in the first stages of the DTs, but when I moved he whispered again, "'George, don't leave me alone.' For a second, I don't know why, I was very disturbed, but I fought for a grip on myself, and tried to talk him out of it. "'You certainly brought in a wonderful catch of foxes.' I tried to be casual. Where'd you get him? He looked at me, staring as though he hadn't the least idea of what I was talking about, and let his glance rove to the pile of furs on the bar. For a full minute, he didn't say anything. Then he shuddered violently. It's the duckfoot, he whimpered. The duckfoot and the stick. You should see what it done to Matt Brazil. What duckfoot and what stick, and what did it do to Matt Brazil? Pug stared into space. I tried to shake it off, he whispered. I tried to. The trees were all green there, big tall trees. That's where the foxes lived. I tried to shake it off, but it followed me. It caught Matt Brazil, and you should see what it done to him. It will come here. That was nonsense. In the first place, there aren't any trees in the Arctic. In the second place, this talk of a duckfoot and a stick doing something terrible to Matt Brazil, another North City fox trapper, was just the inane ramblings of a trapper who had too much to drink. As for the duckfoot and the stick following Pug to North City, <laughs> Marsha was needed here. I stood up, put my hand on Pug's shoulder, and shook him. He blinked into drunken attention. Pug, I said clearly, sit right where you are. No duckfoot and stick can get you in here. The door's shut. A pathetic expression of hope and relief crossed his eyes. He mumbled something that I did not hear. I'm going to get Marsha, I said. We'll keep you safe from the duckfoot and the stick. Don't move until I come back. I pulled my parker about me and went back into the wind-blasted street. Pug's four huskies were stretched in their traces, sleeping, and they raised indifferent heads when I came out. I had seen them before, but only now did I notice how thin and worn they were, and the blood that stained the snow beneath their paws. For a moment I looked uneasily at them. Wherever he had come from, Pug had certainly given his dogs a lot of punishment. I— That was silly. There couldn't be any truth in the wild, disconnected story he had told— Tall green trees, foxes big as wolves, and a duckfoot and a stick that had done something terrible to Matt Brazil. Only the foxes were real, and exactly where had Pug Davenport taken those pelts? Certainly no other man had ever seen foxes like them. Somewhere back in those godforsaken barrens, Pug might even have found trees. But the duckfoot and the stick. I broke into a run. The darkness seemed unreal full of moving things. Deliberately, I slowed to a walk. A man had to keep his head, and there was nothing with which he could not cope as long as he let nothing excite him. Whatever Pug Davenport had seen on the barrens, cut it out, I told myself. He didn't see anything. I swerved to Marsha Davenport's lamp-lighted house and knocked on the door. Marsha opened it, and a gust of wind blew sugar-like snow across the kitchen floor. I slipped inside, shut the door behind me, and let my hungry eyes feast on her. Somehow the loveliest pictures my mind ever drew were never quite so lovely as she herself, and always when I was near her, I wondered why she should even think of marrying me or any other man. 
A god would be a more fitting mate for Marsha Davenport. She smiled. Hello, George. Take off your parka. I stood against the door, the parka swinging about my knees. For a second I groped for words, wondering how to break gently to Marsha the news that Pug was back and having a real bender up at Herschel's. Common sense came to my rescue. In a good many ways, Marsha was exactly like Pug, not afraid of much, and seldom hesitating to tackle anything. Pug's back, I told her. She nodded, grasping at once everything I meant. Is he bad? she asked quietly. Quite bad. You'd better come. All right, just a minute. She went into another room, and when she came out, she was wearing the exquisite fawnskin parka that Pug himself had made for her. Marcia smiled at me, and grasped my elbow reassuringly. I groped happily beside her, thoroughly ashamed now of my own near panic. Somehow it seemed that nothing could ever go wrong as long as Marcia was near. There was something deep inside her that seemed incapable of being moved or even ruffled by anything from the outside. A quiet strength. Whatever came, Marcia could face and cope with it. And right at that moment, I thought more strongly than ever that this girl beside me represented not only the highest type of womanhood, but the highest of humanity. Together we walked up the street, Marcia bending her head against the wind, and holding tight to my elbow to steady herself. We were nearly opposite Herschel's, when I had an almost irresistible impulse to cross to the other side of the street. There seemed to be something over there overwhelmingly magnetic. Something that I could not see, but only feel. Marcia was one step ahead of me, pulling me by the arm and looking questioningly up into my face. Come on, she made herself heard above the steady roar of the wind. I must go over there. I took another step forward and stopped in my tracks. Deliberately, forcefully fighting some mighty summons that pulled me forward, I took two steps backward and the pressure lessened slightly. A cold hand seemed to be stroking my spine, a clammy breath pouring down my neck. I recognized those symptoms as the awakening of fear, terror such as that which was reflected so plainly in Pug Davenport's face. I tried to summon reason to my aid, but all I could be sure of was that, though I did not know what lay on the other side of the street— I did know that it was something to be very much afraid of. "'Come on!' I shouted. "'Pug's in the saloon. But I must go across the street. Come on!' I screamed. Fighting for every inch, doing my utmost to resist the powerful impulse that said I must cross the street, I half dragged her toward the saloon. When we had gone ten feet farther, we seemed to pass out of the orbit of whatever had tried to influence us. So strong had been my pressure on Marsha's arm that immediately we both stumbled into the snow. We arose and brushed ourselves off. Marsha, puzzled, turned around. I don't know why, she said, but I had the strangest feeling back there that I must cross the street. Nonsense, I told her. Come on. We reached the saloon. Joe Urschel had no sign in front of his establishment but he did keep an electric fan turned on the window before the bar in winter, so that frost would not cloud it, and passers-by could readily see a place of refreshment. I glanced up at that window to see the faces of Al Pettigrew and Moose-Eyed Allen plastered against it. Their eyes were staring, their mouths agape. Plainly, they had had some terrific surprise or shock. Careful to swing Marsha the other way when we entered, I pointed to the back end of the room. "'Pug's there,' I said. She hurried back, and I approached the two men who were staring out the window. "'What's wrong?' I asked. "Uh, "'Urschel,' Al Pettigrew ejaculated. "'What's the matter with Urschel?' "'He—he floated away.' "'What? That's right,' Moosehide said. "'He was going over to Pete Gallagher's for a set of hinges.' But as soon as he got across the street, he turned and went down it, right to that little black stick laying there. He stood there a minute or more, rocking back and forth and like to fall, then then he floated away. His legs was two feet off the ground. You're crazy. George, I ain't crazy and I ain't drunk. 
Moosehide said angrily. Herschel's parka was wrinkled, like a rabbit's fur when a wolf's hole in it. Nothing carried him. He floated. Something seemed to pervade the room, a cold and fear-inspiring presence that had no shape or form, but yet had definite being. I turned around to see Marcia bent over her father, stroking his temple with her hand, and swing the bottle of whiskey behind her. Pug groped for it like a pleading child, and Marcia permitted him a short drink. Pug fell across the table, hopelessly drunk, and Marcia sat down opposite him. I walked back. How is he? He'll be all right, George. Marcia smiled at me, and I felt weak all over. Did he tell you anything? He had some story about a duck foot and a stick, and said that I must keep away from the stick or I'd never get away. I think he's more bushed out than drunk. Yes, that's it, I agreed. He's bushed out. That's a term we apply to anybody who's been out in the barrens too long, and has gone a little crazy as a consequence. Association with others generally fixes them up, but I knew that Pug Davenport was not bushed out. And now I knew also that wherever he had caught those foxes, he had also met some unreal, inhuman thing about which the whiskey that fogged his brain prevented his telling us. Doubtless the surprise had been mutual, but whatever the monster was, it had followed Pug back to North City and was preying on human beings. I walked to the front of the saloon and looked thoughtfully at Urshel's thirty or six hanging on a rack of caribou horns over the bar. Al Pettigrew sidled down to me. What, what do you suppose it is, Doc? he asked. Nothing at all, Al. By the way, what became of Pug's dog team? They took off down the street, sled and all, howling like banshees. <laughs> Doc, there's something out there. Nonsense, I snapped, anything to avoid a panic. What could be out there? You ain't fooling me, Al said suddenly. I seen it. What did you see? Nothing. There you are. Don't go starting crazy rumors. I'm going out there. I'm staying here, Al mumbled. Keep the door locked if you're afraid. I aim to. I'll go with you, Moosehide offered. No thanks, you needn't. I took Urshel's big thirty or six from the rack and stepped out on the porch. My intention was to stand there and blast the stick with a soft-nosed bullet from the gun. But when I looked, the stick was not there, nor was there any indication of the powerful force that had tried to drag Marsha and myself across the street. Carefully, the gun leveled, I walked to where the stick had been. A strange, musty odour, vaguely like that of an aroused ermine, pervaded the air. Slowly, a step at a time, I went forward. The snow was blowing down the street, a fine mist of hard flakes, but it had blown over the place where the stick had lain, and I stopped short. Just ahead of me were half a dozen long, triangular tracks, almost exactly like those that might be left by a duck walking in the mud. But these tracks were longer than my own, and proportionately wide. I gasped, and raised the rifle for something to shoot at. But there was nothing, only the musty odour, and the half-dozen tracks that were lost in snow-blown nothingness. Slowly I turned around, saw sweet Thomas's daughter step out of her house at the end of the street. A slim girl, with her father's colouring and her mother's patient acceptance of whatever came, Lorna turned suddenly and walked to the other side of the street. She stopped short, swaying back and forth, coming dangerously near falling, but always rising again. It was then that I saw the black stick, directly between her feet. I yelled and ran as fast as I could— but before I was able to cover half the distance, I saw Lorna Thomas rise in the air. Her parka was wrinkled, as though something had hold of her there. The little black stick was on the other side, floating through the air about three feet from the ground. I flung myself to one knee and leveled the rifle. But at once, the futility of my own position became apparent. There was nothing to shoot at, nothing except the dangling girl and the little black stick. I sighted squarely between them, and pressed the trigger. 
A hollow, chuckling sound rose high above the seething wind and floated back to me. Whatever carried Lorna Thomas broke into a run so swift that I was unable to keep them in sight. I shot again and again, and ran as fast as I could. But all I found was the line of huge duck tracks that again faded into wind-blown snow. I was terribly shaken when I got back to the saloon. For a few seconds, wild hysteria threatened. I grabbed a bottle, took a long pull, and slammed the bottle down on the bar. Al Pettigrew sidled up to me. I told you, he leered. There is something out there, ain't there? That, more than anything else, sobered me. Al Pettigrew was the sort of nameless spawn, product of a father who had never seen him, and a mother who had never wanted him, that you'll find in the North or anywhere else. He had a weak and flabby face in which abject terror lived. I, product of a high-class home and the finest scientific training man can provide, was supposed to be just a little better than that. Yes, I snapped. There is something. Now shut up. Again, I tried to bring reason to my aid, calling up and rejecting every scientific rule and theorem I had ever heard of, and inventing a few on the spot. But nothing applied. There was no precedent for this. All I knew was that a monster had come among us, a monster with a trap that held people helpless. The trap was easier to figure out. Doubtless it was some sort of metal, with a very strong magnetic attraction for living flesh. Neoglowance had property similar to that, and probably this was some variety of such a metal. The creature that bore it must have form and substance, but was of a pigmentation that could not be discerned by the human eye. Certainly every resident of North City was doomed, unless we could find a way to stop it. But how can you take action against that which you cannot see? Now that the thing had discovered human haunts, when it was finished with North City, it had only to go south. Then? I walked back to where Marcia was still sitting beside the drunken pug. Now the Arctic day had changed to the deeper gloom of night, and the lights glowed brightly. Marcia had folded her parka into a pillow, placed it under Pug's reclining head. Pug began to snore. "'Is he all right?' I asked. Marcia smiled, and again I felt that curious weakness. I would have licked her boots for her any time, and when she smiled I would have cut off my own arm if she'd asked me to. "'He's all right,' she said. "'Let him rest. I don't think he's slept in the past two weeks. Okay.' I tried to sound casual. Let him spend the night in his chair. But hadn't you better lie down? There's a cot in the back room. No, thank you. She smiled again. I'll sit with him. I'm really used to it, George. Good enough. I returned to the front of the saloon, for the first time thankful that this girl had been so engrossed with her sick father that she'd scarcely noticed anything else. Al and Mooside looked uneasily at me as I laid the thirty ought six across my knees and pulled a chair in front of the door. If anything came in that door, I determined, it was going to cross my dead body before it got to the girl in back. Ain't, ain't you taking this a mite serious? Moosehide demanded. Lie down, I said. Try to get some sleep. We have a job to do in the morning. Well, I suppose it's all right if you say so. All night I kept vigil before the door, the cocked rifle across my lap. It seemed unreal, almost ridiculous. I, George Mallory, waiting with a rifle across my lap for something that I could not see when it came. As the slow hours dragged by, it seemed sillier than ever, and all my thoughts of last night even more silly. No, there had to be some more reasonable explanation of everything. The thin grey daylight crept upon us, and I think that is the time when I dozed off. I was awakened by a rush of cold air in the face, and jumped up. Moosehide sat on the bar, nonchalantly swinging his legs. I looked toward the back end of the saloon, saw Pug still sprawled across his table. "'Where's Marsha? I demanded. "'Why, she said she was going to take and get Pug some hot victuals,' Moosehide drawled. When did she go? 
maybe two minutes passed. I sprang to the door and looked out, just in time to see Marsha Davenport across the street, standing directly over the little black stick. She bent forward until her head almost brushed the snow and straightened. I gasped, took one step toward her, but, even as I did, I saw her lifted into the air and begin to float away. The little black stick floated beside her. I was ice cold. If Marsha Davenport was not alive in it, I knew that the world would offer no more inducement for me to stay alive. But yet I did not run after her. I was thinking more completely and swiftly than I had ever thought before. I raced to the back of the room and slapped Pug Davenport across the cheek. He mumbled and shifted his head to the other arm. I slapped him again and again, and when slapping did no good, poured a bucket of cold water over his head. Pug awoke slowly and blinked at me. Pug! I screamed. Listen! The duckfoot and the stick! They have taken Marsha! Never before have I seen so swift a change in any man. Pug leaped erect. There was no trace of fear in him now, no hesitation. And at that moment I was very proud to be a human being. This little derelict had come in from the barrens, terrified by something that had taken place out there. But when the same thing threatened his daughter, Pug could forget his own fear to go to her aid. He snatched the thirty ought six from my hands and raced out the door. Though my legs are longer than his, it was very hard just to keep up. Again, as soon as we got outside, there was an aura of ermine musk. A hollow exclamation, a parody of that which might come from a human hunter who was just bagged an especially fine head of game, seemed to linger in the air. And there were the duck tracks, huge triangular marks in the snow. If I breathed any sort of prayer, it was one of thanksgiving that there was no blowing snow this morning to cover them. We raced out of town into the barrens, stopping where the thing had stepped, running as hard as we could. And it was a half mile away, almost in North City's backyard, that we came upon the snowbank. Something huge and powerful had piled that snow, and I looked with glazed eyes upon the things that were hanging from it. The skins of Matt Brazil, Joe Urschel, Lorna Thomas, stretched on the snow as we would stretch bearskins. The frozen, nude carcasses were cast haphazardly into the snow before it. I gasped. A trapper that sought the skins of human beings just as we sought those of foxes. I saw Marsha. She was hanging, head down, from the snowbank. The black stick on top of the bank at her feet seemed to be holding her up. There was absolutely no evidence of anything else, yet I knew something was there. From Pug Davenport's throat there rolled a hoarse, terrible, snarling animal cry. He threw himself down on one knee and leveled the rifle. I could still see nothing, but he took a steady aim. He pressed the trigger. The rifle blasted. At the same time, a fine spray erupted from the snowbank. I saw Marsha slide from it, crawl a little way through the snow, and get up to run toward me. More snow flew, and there was a great threshing, as though up there near the bank some mighty animal was in its death throes. Pug shot again, and again. A wild scream split the air. I saw a line of duck tracks coming toward us, and Pug shot again. He clubbed the rifle and raced forward to give battle to whatever opposed him. A huge bloodstain spread on the snow. I heard Pug gasp saw him borne backwards on the snow. His throat seemed of its own volition to be constricting. His eyes bulged, and horrible, gasping breath sputtered from his open mouth. I sprang forward, receiving a mighty blow that sent me reeling back. When I had recovered, Pug Davenport lay quietly on the snow. The line of duck tracks, marked frequently by huge splashes of blood, was wobbling across the barrens. I saw them reach the Sheep River, and another terrible scream floated back as the ice parted, and the river's freezing waters opened to receive the thing. When I looked for the little black stick, 
it was nowhere to be seen. Marsha was coming toward me, like one awakening from a dream. She looked down at Pug, and I saw the agony that crossed her eyes. Just as swiftly, I saw her conquer it. She shook her head. What happened? she asked. I left Urshul's, and that's the last I remember. I stared past her, fascinated by the black, gaping hole in the river where the thing had gone down. With an effort, I tore my eyes away from it, looked back at Marcia. Strength returned, and with it came sense. I looked straight into her eyes, anything to keep her from turning her head to see what was left of the three human beings trapped by the thing. He, I began, and stopped. Marcia, when grief is gone, let pride replace it. North City lives because Pug Davenport died. I... I dared not continue to blurt out the truth and have this girl who to me meant more than anything else on earth question my own sanity. At the moment I questioned it myself. But not after Marcia walked up to me, buried her face in my chest, and started to cry. Then I knew that at last Marcia Davenport had given herself to me that happiness and delight would spring out of the seeds planted by death and terror. I looked once more at the tracks and the great blood splashes in the snow. The wind would cover them. The Sheep River did not give up its dead. As I gathered Marsha a little closer to me, I looked down at the face of her father. For the first time, it seemed a peaceful and a happy face and I bless the thought that had bade me wake Pug Davenport up, and set him out to rescue his daughter. The thing was of no colour that normal eyes could see, but Pug's eyes were the only ones in North City that did not react normally. Of all the men who had ever been there, he was the only one who was totally colour blind. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.